You're watching PMA Perspective, a statewide source for business, government, and policy news. Bringing you newsmaker interviews with Carl Marrera. The final word with Mr. Fred Anton. And from our studios in Harrisburg, here is your host, David Taylor. Welcome to PMA Perspective, your weekly half-hour news program on Pennsylvania business, government, and politics. I'm your host, David Taylor, president of the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Recently, I had the chance to take part in the Return of Manufacturing Forum held by CPA Accountancy and Business Advisory Network, Baker Tilly. Later on, we'll have a newsmaker interview with Jeff George, a partner at that law firm. But first, let's go to my conversation with Andy Funk, the CEO of Cambridge Lee Industries in Berks County. Let's take a look. Andy Funk from Cambridge Lee Industries, thanks so much for being with us on PMA Perspective. Thank you for having me. Well, absolutely. So, so we were together as part of the, uh, the Baker Tilly Forum on manufacturing, and the folks brought you in because you have a great story. Can you tell them about bringing jobs to Berks County? Sure. Uh, in 2013, our parent company decided to relocate a manufacturing operation from Mexico to our Berks County campus. So we did a $65 million expansion, and uh, we repatriated a plant uh, here at Berks County. So, so can you describe your business and what it is that you make? Yeah, uh, about two-thirds of our business. We manufacture copper tubing at our campus in Berks County, and um, we have about 25% of the U.S. market share of the plumbing tube business, and we also manufacture copper tubing for the HVAC industry. Uh, the other third of our business, we're a distributor of copper focus products, so we don't manufacture those products, but it's brass, copper, tellurium, other red metals. What spurred the decision to uh, to take those operations and to move them from, from Mexico mm -hmm. and bring it back to Pennsylvania? Well, our manufacturing has been in Pennsylvania for 75 years. It had originally been Reading Tube Corporation, if you're mm. familiar with that. Mm -hmm. And our parent company had built a state-of-the-art cast and roll manufacturing operation in Mexico. And just as they were about to go commercially live, uh, the U.S. federal ITC passed an anti-dumping suit against the importation of copper tube from Mexico and China. Mm. So that made it economically infeasible for a parent company to produce copper tube for the U.S. market. So they mothballed the plant for about two years while they decided what to do with it, and ultimately the decision was made to relocate that plant to Pennsylvania. Well, we had a really good discussion on that in, in, the, in the forum. Let's, let's take a look. Um, but why Pennsylvania? A couple reasons. Um, first, we had our manufacturing operations here, so it made a lot of sense to co-locate everything on one campus. Uh, but the other thing that's nice about Pennsylvania is we do have a, a rich history of strong metals manufacturing background. So I think that's a real benefit that we have. Um, and I think that's something that we need to pay attention to. Um, it's getting harder and harder to find skilled trade. Uh, there's uh, projections that over the next 10 years, there's going to be a deficit of about 2 million jobs in manufacturing. And so to the extent that we can continue to have um, a good labor source here, which is being more and more challenging, could differentiate Pennsylvania as a employer or, uh, or location for employers. So that would be a benefit. Um, the other reason that I think we, we chose Pennsylvania, which was great, was some of the ease of uh, local bodies in, um, in facilitating the relocation. Uh, when we decided to move, I reached out to um, John Scott at the Greater Reading Economic Partnership, who reached out to Commissioner Christian Leinbach, and we put together a group. It was called Project Police because the coppers were coming. And uh, <laughs> we had all the stakeholders in one room, and we didn't... There were no, there was no um, administrative requirements that we we skipped. Rather, we found ways to get everyone together and said, "Okay, let's let's do things simultaneously instead of sequentially." So the um, the operation today, I guess, how many folks do you have, mm -hmm. and what's the volume of your production? Sure. So uh, we spend about a quarter billion dollars a year on copper. Mm. Um, we have uh, a little over 500 employees. Um, this expansion um, will ultimately add a little over 200 jobs. So far we've already added over 100 jobs as a result of it. So, um, and, and the other thing I think is it increases our footprint here in Pennsylvania. I mean, we mentioned this during the forum, but you know, it's industrial manufacturing is a very capital intensive operation. Um, so when you invest the capital, um, you're not going to be as elastic as 
moving um, sure. down the road, so we were anchored here. And uh, we've got great employees. Um, we're now turned the corner in getting the plant up and running and operationally and commercially viable, so we've gone through the startup period. Um, now we're in a growth mode. We're looking at um, acquisitions and adding new product platforms. So it's going to provide well, a lot of opportunities great. for employees for years that's to come. That's great to hear. And I was going to ask, what, what is the, um, the next chapter um, in terms of, of the, the goals of the company for growth and, uh, and new markets? Sure. Well, the, the new plant um, is state-of-the-art for manufacturing copper tubing, and it has a lot more concentricity of the wall thickness. Mm -hmm. So instead of melting metal, um, into a log that you cut into a billet that you put through an extrusion press. With this new process, you melt the copper directly into what's called a mother tube. So mm. there's almost perfect wall thickness all the way around. Um, and that allows you to get much more precision in light wall tubes for you know, different OEM applications. So there we're looking at a lot more niche op uh, applications with the copper tubes, and so not just the plumbing, but um, into a lot of original equipment manufacturers, mostly in the HVAC industry. Um, so there we're, we're looking at new products, new processes uh, that we're not currently in. And then, as I mentioned, we also have a business development team that we kicked off that's looking at potential acquisitions with ultimately the goal of adding you know, a new platform into our, our portfolio of products. That's wonderful. So with, with the operations um, and, and you know, ramping up, what are, the, what are some of the challenges that you've met? What are things that Pennsylvania needs to improve in order to be more competitive in your opinion? Yeah, well, one thing, you know, we do need, um, one of the reasons we chose Pennsylvania was because of the rich manufacturing history in metals, but um, we need more, more, uh, more, in, more young kids going into skilled trades. We have a, a real challenge hiring um, maintenance folks, um, quality engineers, um, you know, different, different technical positions are, are just hard to, to get. So I think that's something we need to do a better job with. But it's incumbent on us to to reach out into the community to make sure that we're communicating with, um, you know, our local school districts and the superintendents and principals and teachers, so that they're aware yeah. of what's going on in their community. Um, the fact that that, that careers, um, you know, like at Cambridge Lee, are are available for young people, and making those educators mindful of. Um, you know, helping to prepare their students in the community for jobs that already exist there. Yeah, and I think some of it, some of it is providing access to the students, so doing things like um, what's so cool about manufacturing video uh, that, that they did last year. That I think that's run by the MRC, um, Berks Business Education Coalition uh, facilitated that. It was a great program. Um, there's a manufacturing day where we have middle school kids tour for a week. Um, we'll have every day for four hours different uh, middle school kids bust in. So getting access to the students and then I think also talking with the parents. Yes. Um, there is uh, going to be a great need for manufacturing. Projections are over the next 10 years there'll be 2 million jobs that won't be able to be filled. Um, it, you, I think parents need to understand that there's um, with a supply and demand imbalance comes um, a wage rate uh, mm. benefit. Um, yes. Throughout the United States, jobs in manufacturing, um, the salary and benefits are about 25% higher than in private sector non-manufacturing jobs. Uh, it's critical for our economy. 12.5% of our GDP is driven by manufacturing. When you look at manufacturing output, it's closely correlated to stock performance. So it um, provides great opportunities for uh, our citizens, and it's important for our whole country's economy. Uh, the last thing I would say is um, I don't think that the, uh, we do enough as a state to offer financial incentives for the relocation. Um, we were able to access some stimulus money because ultimately this, this project should add over 200 jobs to the, uh, the community. Um, we got you know, a PETA and a MELF loan, about $5 million, so that's nice, but the interest rate, we, we do have to pay interest on it. And you know, with the environment, the rates were not significantly less than we were getting already from commercial lenders. And to be honest, the $5 million that we borrowed was um, probably more challenging to get through intercreditor agreements than the $80 million line that we had with the seven bank syndication. So um, I think there's more opportunity there. Well, amen to that. And uh, what a wonderful uh, chance to meet you and to hear about 
um, your great success in, in, in Berks County. Thank Andy, you. where can people go to learn more about you and your company and the things that you're doing? Sure, if they just Google Cambridge Lane Industries, they'll pull up our website and uh, we'll be happy to, to show you more about our company. Outstanding. Great. Andy Funk, thank you so much for being with me. Thank you, Plush was mine. Jeff George from Baker Tilly, thanks so much for taking time to be with me. Pleasure. So um, with the forum today, we were talking about uh, manufacturing and international trade. Um, the, the current moment in time, of course, you know, with the presidential election and revisiting NAFTA and those, those kinds of things, the death of TPP, um, you know, TTIP still alive, but, you know, the outcome uncertain. What is your view on, on this current moment in time? What do you think is driving the, the debate on these issues? Again, this is both my view as a, as a professional, but also as a partner in, at Baker Tilly. We find that what's driving the, the energy in the issue is really trying to put the U.S. economy first, which is applaudable. That's a, it's an understandable thing if you want to lead a country to prosperity. Uh, the means through which it's being done is where we see the dissension, right? I think, uh, uh, in general, whether it's in economic circles or policy or, or, or business, most people probably would agree that they want the country to do well. They want individuals themselves to do well. How to make that happen is where I think the rubber begins to meet the road and where some of the dissension begin to happen. Dissensions that are driven by either a specific industry sector relative to what policy is looking to shape up to be, uh, whether it's through uh, 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 policy and driven by partisanship or ideology. So it's there's no shortage of complexity. Jeff, I thought you put that well in your intro. Manufacturing, as we used to know it, unfortunately, just won't be the same way. There's, there's a different perspective on jobs that I can share later or even during the panel. But this speaks to the fact that much of these items are imported, and they come from some of our top trading partners, right? Starting with Canada. Right? Not only do they own a little bit of our debt, but there are a number of U.S. jobs that depend on goods made in Canada. They're brought in and then sold or serviced via the U.S. How many jobs would you say in the U.S. that depend on trade that we do with Canada? It's close to 10 million. It's a big number, right? If we put up a border that will keep create a challenge for products to come in from Canada, it will affect uh, about 10 million people who have to deal with those, those, uh, those items and, and marketing and servicing them in the U.S. Likewise with Mexico, right? One of our top trading partners. They hold a little bit of our debt, but it's a highly intrinsically connected economy, right? Five million people actually depend on jobs and trade with the U.S. for, and this is just for a particular sector. It's not even total numbers. And with China, they hold significant amount of debt from the U.S. And we try to identify numbers for the overall number of jobs in the U.S. that are tied to the Chinese economy. And we couldn't get an aggregate number. So we figured we'd focus on one sector, and that's retail alone. And it's a pretty staggering number. It's close to 42 million. Right, so the moment that we begin as a nation to try to take a more active role in how we connect and trade with other partners, by default, we have to start looking at what will that do to our own economy? Will we drive more jobs? Or are we going to actually hurt job creation or job retention? Because, and this is one of the themes that, that, we, that we hit in the, in the discussion, that um, manufacturers, American manufacturers, uh, if we're going to be successful, we need to find more customers. And so opening up new markets you know, overseas, that needs to be part of our success. You also you know, you're mindful of the, the globalization of supply chains mm -hmm. and that, um, you know, again, this is part of, of, of lean manufacturing, of just-in-time delivery. And so, you know, at the same time that we are making sure that, um, that our trading partners aren't, uh, you know, abusing these deals or, or you know, doing un engaging in unfair practices, we also need to be mindful that we that we don't um, you know undermine or kill <laughs> off the things that have helped us to be successful thus far that's right yeah and, and I think that there's a, a huge element of um, individual responsibility upon each company mm -hmm. right there there are things that happen at a macro level that expose companies to risk or to opportunity but at the end of the day an executive team is responsible for charting the course and executing the course of a company's success 
So when you, you talk about the sort of the impetus for considering expansion abroad, um, much of that, in my mind, is just a business imperative. The U.S. is a tremendous market. It commands 30% of the world consumption power, spending power. It's also very mature. There's mm -hmm. still a lot of room for growth, no mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. But you still have 70% of the purchasing power that resides outside of the U.S. In countries that have an appetite for U.S.-made goods, that have an appetite for U.S.-owned brands, mm -hmm. and the quality that is almost inevitably attached to a U.S. made product and or a U.S. brand. So that is a huge card in the deck of a company that's looking to diversify revenues, uh, make themselves uh, less exposed to economic downturns at home, uh, become stronger as a business, uh, get a read on their competition that maybe is abroad and importing to the U.S. Mm -hmm. by operating their own market. Right? You, you, you change, your DNA as a business changes, not because of something you do in terms of export, mm -hmm. but by something you become, which is an internationally minded company. Yes. Right. How do we use America's economic strength to support our allies and our values and our shared interests through commerce? I'd venture to say that there are a few ways in which we do that, right? The first one is through basic economic fundamentals. Um, the intellectual property that, that we carry in the U.S., the innovative design, use, and, and value of a product that is either U.S. made, U.S. designed, and or U.S. Uh, branded, um, where the acumen comes out of here, has the ability to shape how certain markets function, right? So. In my mind, there's an element of, of corporate prosperity that either a, a, a county, a state, or an overall nation can bring to trading partners to say, look, there are things you guys don't make as well as we do. Right, right. There are also things that you guys make that we don't. Right. Um, how can we continue to have our trade prosper and in light of that, protect each other's interests? Right, because you might be... Uh, uh, exposed to warfare in ways that if you were to be affected, you're going to shut down our electronics industry, mm -hmm. right? Or if you were to have a, uh, you know, a bio attack on your, on your crop growing capacity, you're going to create significant, you know, food production issues that interconnect our countries. So I don't, I don't see the alliance between and among countries devoid of their commercial relationship. Yes. Um, and I think that's also where sustainability comes from, right? You're, you're less likely to think ill of your partner when you realize how interdependent your economies are. I was interested in many things, but two in particular. One, what is the pulse in Congress or in the houses in general in Congress uh, relative to NAFTA? Because it's very difficult to think of the U.S. economy and not think of NAFTA, right, if you think of the cross flow of, of trade among all three countries. So not just the pulse from Congress, but also Mr. Sessions' pulse himself because he's a chairman, right? He's got the gavel. He's, he wields tremendous influence. And those two things might be different. And what we learned, and it was hope instilling, was that the sense in terms of Congress in general is that there's more to agree upon related to NAFTA than there is to disagree, right? which was encouraging. But what was particularly encouraging was his position. And he took a, a chart that we, we delivered a report with some of our recommendations we've been providing since the beginning of the year related to NAFTA to the new administration. And he pointed, you know, this is a, a Republican from Texas, so there's a keep that in mind as, as his perspective. And he said, look at this line. And it had a very clear ascension of increase in trade and a fairly balanced in terms of deficit and surplus. He said, this is working. If I have anything to do with it, which I do, my intent is to only let things in that will make this better. In other words, we don't want to make NAFTA any, any different if it's going to detract from this continued growth where both nations have benefited. It's obviously in America's national interest for Mexico to be, um, to be stable and prosperous and um, and for them to mature to become a first world country because the, you know, the instability and, and poverty and all those things 
in Mexico directly affects the U.S. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, even as the, and again, this is just sort of my, you know, my opinion, my view, I hope that the, that the, the administration in Washington recognizes that while there are, you know, while there are tensions and while there are areas of dispute, you know, in the long run, we really are in all this together. I think at an individual level, people recognize that. But to, to go back to a, a point you made and the healthy, <clears throat> the health and how healthy the U.S.-Canada relationship is, in my view, is partly driven by the uh, per capita income and social equality mm -hmm. yes. between the two. Yes. Much more friction tends to happen when that's not the case, as it is with Mexico. Yes, right? exactly. Um, Ildefonso Guajardo, the, the Minister of the Economy for, for Mexico, um, absolutely brilliant man. If you have a chance to read what he writes, watch him speak, get a chance to meet him, fascinating man. And he, he makes quick quips that are, are memorable. One of them was, business likes certainty. Mm -hmm. And we see that in general environment, irrespective of administration. But there's another element that he mentioned, and we were in a forum discussing this, that everybody agreed on, which is the fact that prosperity is the best immigration policy you can have on the other side of the border, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, exactly. and there was an outflux of Mexican nationals back to Mexico as Mexico began to, to improve. And it continues to be the case in a lot of ways. Um, so this codependency and the intri intrinsic nature of the economies functioning together and people just having a positive outcome on all sides of the board. I think that that's shared by most at a human level. The, the challenge comes when you start talking about how a social inequality or a, an economic disparity between two countries create tensions that then become partisan concerns. Right. Right. Well, and, and then, you know, conversely, um, you know, I look on the U.S. trade relationship with China as a fundamentally different thing uh, in that of course, that we we want uh, China, the Chinese people, to be prosperous, to have opportunity. Um, but the recognition, I think, the recognition must be given that China is not a market economy, that they have uh, an authoritarian government, and that in parallel to our economic relationship, that there are also political and military. Uh, dynamics that are not good for the U.S. How can we use our economic leverage to advance our our interests and our values, and also to defend our country against what is potentially a hostile power? As a government, their approach to any any government, their approach to ethics and um, how to deal with diplomatic relations. That's we can influence. I think an element of that with trade but only to a certain degree, right? Because if, if sanctions are imposed to drive a, uh, more uh, congenial behavior, right, out of, say, China, it's going to have an impact here, mm -hmm. right? If you're going to impo impose sanctions on textiles, right, or consumer electronics, invariably the companies that we see looking out this window are going to be impacted, right? Irrespective of where they're headquartered in the U.S., there's going to be a material effect in commerce, and and where do where does a uh, an action that we might take to drive a different behavior from would be allies mm -hmm. um, is going to impact our own economy? It's very delicate, and and I think in some ways the U.S. has done a really good job uh, keeping friends close and and proverbial enemies closer. Mm -hmm. um, North Korea relationship notwithstanding. Um, mm. they, they're not close to many, mm. as folks know. Um, but with China, it, it's a unique uh, circumstance, right? They're on the surface very commercially driven, but the underlying foundation is is not necessarily one of an open market necessarily or an open economy, uh, so to speak. So it's, I, I think it's a still an evolving system, um, and we just have to protect ourselves. Jeff, my question now is, so following the demise of, of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was years in the making, and yeah. it was all 
it was just trashed. So, you know, our, our allies in that region or our, our, our partners in that region, um, we essentially left them at the altar. Um, what do we do now to try to, I mean, like, it, to me, it's insane that we don't have a trade agreement with Japan. Like, how is that possible that we can have, you know, so much commerce with an allied nation and not have a formal trade agreement? Where do mm -hmm. we go from here? Um, you know, it, it really is the end of the show where, you know, somebody doesn't get the rose, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. Th that was the, the fate of TPP. The, the thing that I always asked myself as TPP was coming into being was, is this about trade? Mm -hmm. Which it is, but what percentage of the motivation for TPP is politically driven to keep China out? Right. 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 As long as the U.S. plays that role, it's harder to get China into that mix. Well, mm -hmm. that's that 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 cork has been popped out of the bottle right um the relationship with japan which i agree i think that was one of the the cornerstones of that the economic strength that that, that tpp would bring is unfortunate um however there is not just the commerce ties between us and japan but there are a lot of other interests right social political and, and bellic um, that the nations share so I don't think that it'll go away, but I think it will uh, take on the form of if there is a dialogue there, which I have not heard a lot about, doesn't mean that there wouldn't be. Right. Um, but the dialogue would be more on the bilateral agreement, which is what the new administration has an appetite for. Mm -hmm. right? We find that there's a, there's an element of TPP that we'll likely see in NAFTA 2.0. Mm -hmm. Because it was such a modern way to look at conducting trade among multiple nations. Yes. Right? There's, I mean, there was beauty in what was designed in there. So, and I think there's consensus um, across all three countries that that it should remain and that we should see versions of that come to life in the new NAFTA. So maybe that will be a bit of a sticker on the wall to say, hey guys, remember TPP? How mm -hmm. do we either revisit or look at these relationships that are sort of hanging out there like Japan? and and regroup in a constructive manner. So, Jeff George from Baker Tilly, a real pleasure to have you on the program. Where can the viewers go to learn more about you and the work that you're doing? Well, again, thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. Um, folks can learn about Baker Tilly if they go to bakertilly.com, but also about our broader initiative in terms of uh, becoming an extension of companies to either do more in manufacturing in the U.S., do it better, do it profitably, expand abroad, and capture international markets, they can go to returnofmanufacturing.com. Returnofmanufacturing.com. Right. Outstanding. Jeff, thanks so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, that's all for this week on PMA Perspective. Next week, PMA's Carl Morera heads up north to the New York state line to take a look at life with and without natural gas development. Until then, stay current on what's happening in your state government by visiting pamanufacturers.org. And from everyone here at PMA, Thanks very much for watching.